good day grade 12 learners welcome to today's english fall lesson my name is garabo c day the lesson is brought to you by Gauteng department of education in collaboration with saibono discovery center and broadcast by pagama research and development our topic today is the art of literature remember learners when you get to class and you study literature, what is at stake is 70 marks, two and a half hours, and every one genre is 75 minutes. In our literature study, we have four genres. Section A novel for 35 marks, Section B drama for 35 marks, Section C short stories 35 marks, and poetry for 35 marks. When you study literature, every text or extract is like an iceberg. You know what an iceberg is, Lenas? It's found in the sea. It's a big mountain like but made up of ice and it is covered in water. The bottom layer is level four and five. The middle one is level three. The upper level is level two and we have level one. That is the one that you can see as you approach the iceberg. And what does it entail? With our level one expectation is, candidates, you have to identify the setting, the narrator, the characters, the conflict, and the plot in any particular set work, be it a drama, novel, short story, or poetry. Then you are going to read for level two. When now, you have to know the figurative language and the tone of a particular set work or an extract. We require you to also have an understanding of level three, which requires you to know the themes and the message of your set work. Lastly, you have to deal with open-ended questions where you are required to give your own opinion of a particular extract in the novel, the drama, the short story, or the poetry. We have different genres as I've explained before. With the novel, the expectation is it's made up of a series of events that develops as the story is told. We have sub-stories in this huge big story. So it's a series of events. Then you can have a choice of a drama. And what is a drama? Page to state. Page to stage meaning whatever you have you 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 read in a book, in a drama book, was supposed to be acted on stage or performed on stage. A short story, that's our third gender, usually it has to do with one major conflict and often one major character. Difference with short story and novel, a novel has a lot of characters while the short story has just one major character and uh, two or three supporting characters with poetry we deal with shape structure sound and imagery uh, candidates remember there are commonalities between the novel the drama and the short story, things that we learn about. That is the setting, 
where the story takes place. Who is the narrator of the story? The narrator, the person who tells the story. And then we have the plot. The plot being the storyline. What is the story all about? And who makes up the story? The story is made up of who? The characters. And there is a universal main idea called a theme that we have to learn about. Including the theme, learners, we also go into study figurative language. That's what makes literature very rich. In all this, in all the setbacks, we have a conflict. What is the major problem in this particular setback? And we also go into learn about the tone. When you first read a text that is your novel or your drama, you have to read on level one, like I said before. When you start reading My Children, My Africa, you read your short story, you read your Macbeth, and you read poetry, first thing that you have to learn is what is the what is the setting of the story what is the narrator who are the characters the conflict and the plot when you prepare to write your final end of the year exam all this information that you shall have gathered for the whole year is preparing you for your easy questions that are worth 14 marks. And those type of questions that you're going to uh, answer on, we call them knowledge questions. And you can only master the knowledge questions when you read, you are able to identify the setting, the narrator, the characters, conflict and plot. I must also remind you, learners, that we read firstly for enjoyment. We read to enjoy a particular story. But we have layers that we have to look at. Let's look at the setting. What is a setting? A setting is the physical setting of a story where the story is actually taking place. And what does it refer to? It refers to time. And it also refers to what? To the way a character develops. So when you start reading and you check on the setting, you must remember that you will be asked questions on where and when. Where the story takes place and what was happening in the story who tells us the story that is your drama your short story or your novel it is the person called the narrator and the narrator could be first person narrator it could be somebody who is who knows the background of the story or just one of the characters, and we say that person is a first-person character or first-person narrator. The person gives us a subjective view of what the story is all about, or rather is presenting a slanted view of events. If you were to tell your own story, Lena, you are going to tell it from your point of view, favorable to you. Then we have the narrator called third person or the external uh, narrator. It could be the author or someone who identify, whose identity cannot be established, who is 
more objective and who normally gives us what? A bird's eye view. So can you see the difference? The first person narrator is subjective. The third person narrator is more objective. We also have to learn about characters in the story. And then how do characters become real in a story? We have indirect characterization as well as direct characterization. Indirect characterization, we are looking at the character's actions, how they behave, how they act, how they interact with others, how they appear, and the words that they use, also their thoughts and their feelings. Direct characterization, the author or the, the narrator gives the reader information about the character. We have two types of characters. We have a protagonist, which is the main character. We have the antagonist, which is an opening. We have a character that is developing, that is round, and we have flat or static character. As the story develops, we see characters starting with a particular viewpoint, and they grow, and they become dynamic characters. But there are other characters who are just flat or static. They do not change. And then we also have stock characters. How are these characters developed by the writer? We use what? Their physical description. That's the most common way of describing a character. We identify anything physical about this character. It includes things like height, skin, the hair, and the eye color. Are they short? Are they tall? Are they skinny or fat? Or how they walk or how they stand? So that is the physical description of a character. More importantly, when we learn about characters in the stories, the attitude of a character is most important. How do they feel? How do they appear to feel about what is happening to them in the story? So we checking on their attitude. Think how you would describe your attitude if you were in a similar situation. Recently, I think you have written your task number one, listening comprehension, and you have also written your task number two, an essay. When you get feedback from your teacher on your uh, input or your evidence, what happens? The attitude that you will display when you receive your marks. How would you behave in a particular or in a similar situation? We also are interested as you read, you must check how the character talks, dialogue. That would include the character's words or syntax. We're not only checking on the words, that is the choice of words, we also look at the tone and diction when they speak. That is very important. Our characters have thoughts. We look at their inner thoughts and their feelings. 
How do they feel? The thoughts of a character can only be analyzed if we are inside the head of the character. Never for a second assume you know what a character is thinking. When you study drama, there will be instances where you meet Isabel or Mr. M or Tiny on stage alone and they will be talking to themselves. What are they doing? They are communicating to us as the readers their inner thoughts and how they feel about issues. And that gives us an opportunity to do what? To analyze their thoughts and their attitudes. Very important when you study characters. Reactions of other people. Remember, literature portrays life, real life. The characters will react as they interact with other characters. They will react to what, to other characters, how they are treated, and they will give us insight on what this particular character is. They will react to other people. Other people also will react to them. So it's a two-way street. So at some point, we will be asking you the character traits. How is Tani viewed? How is Isabel reacting to a particular instance? So we call it reactions of other people. They do not react the same way to situations. At the debate with my children, my Africa, Isabel was a bit shy. She started her debate, her opening, not very confident because she's in, she's in a new environment, isn't it? But Tammy was very confident. And to the learners, the audience, how did they respond? To Tammy, they all cheered. And later on, they warmed up to Isabel. So that's the reactions would include verbal responses as well as physical or emotional treatment or reactions. The actions of characters can be deduced by analyzing the effects an action or incident had on a character and his or her reaction to the event. So as you study literature, please be, co be cognizant of the fact that the actions of the characters make up of this particular character. The action or incident determines the way the character develops as the story continues. Reactions of other people that we have done. Initially assent, they react to other people. And now, this very character will react differently to situations. Summary of characterization. Let's look at what we have learned today. How do we know characters? We know our characters through physical description. Their body, how they appear to us, whether they are fat or they are thin. We also learn about our characters through what? Through dialogue, what they say. We also learn about our characters through 
their attitude, their actions, thoughts, reactions of others. Now, for every story, be it a novel or be it short story or drama, every character should want something, even if it is only a glass of water. And that can be a problem. We remember the story, the village people, where the old mother was hungry. Hunger there was a conflict. And what did she do? She pretended as if she was fainting. And the story continued from there in village people. So Kat Monachat, who is the writer, describes it very well that even if the problem was only a glass of water that can bring about conflict. Conflict can be external or can be internal. Conflict can be from men to men or men versus nature or men versus society or it can be man versus self that is internal conflict external it will be with other people internal it should be man to himself let's look at man versus man type of conflict the character struggle against an antagonist we said it earlier an antagonist is what an opponent. The character has an issue. There is a problem. There is a problem between the two characters in the story, or more than two characters in the story. It's a conflict, disagreement, conflict. They don't see eye to eye with the other character. They differ in opinion. And the story must do what? We will try to solve the problem as the story continues. So it is man versus man. Tommy versus Mr. M. So there's the type of conflict that we're talking about. Men versus nature. This is conflict that is happening between a character who is struggling against an external force or an outside force. When a character must overcome some natural obstacle or condition or a conflict with nature, case like in the story cry the beloved country at the beginning of the story we see the people of Ndocheni not in sync with the nature and when they were not in sync with the nature what happened to them they moved from the rural Ndocheni and they decided to go to Johannesburg to look for work and that's that struggle external force. Then we have men versus society. The character struggles against an external force. And this force is not like in nature, but it is what society believes in. When a character has an issue or a problem with something that is happening in the world. So you have force of nature, force with people. So a person now becomes or 
is having a problem with what? With rules, laws, cultural values, traditions, politics, or groups of people. Again, let's look at the Tami story. He is disgruntled about the educational system that was taught during his time and that made him a very unhappy student. And he was in loggerheads with the rules, with the laws. Mr. M expected a particular behavior from Tami, but Tami was... Mm -mm did not want to hear a thing about what Mr. M said. It's a struggle between competing elements within the character when we deal with man versus self. When we say, people will normally say, you know what, I am conflicted. I'm not sure what to do. I don't know whether to believe in this particular thing or not. I must make a decision to do the following, but I have a problem with myself. I have a problem in making a decision. So that is what we call internal conflict. It could be a goal difficult to accomplish, something that is not, that is not working, Let's look at ourselves as grade 12 learners. You have to make several decisions in this year, 2022. One decision will be on Saturday. Should I go to the movies or should I prepare for the English literature exam on Monday? You sit there, you look at the books, and you fight to make the correct decision. But always, when you make a decision to study what happens, at the end you pass. And that will work. Normally, if you have internal conflict, you become emotional. Because these issues are also intellectual and also moral. They make you want to choose. When we learn stories, when we read literature, it makes us grow because we end up making choices and uh, checking on internal conflict. We also going to look at the plot. What is a plot? A plot is a story. In a story, it's a narrative of events arranged in sequence. It moves from one end to the end, to the other end. We focus on the why events happen and the connections between them. Let's look at this fairy tale. It starts with the exposition. That's where the story starts. And the action rises. We have our conflict rising. And at the top there, we have a climax. And now we resolve our problem. It's a falling action and we have our denoma. Our denoma is now our Conclusion. What is exposition? It is the start or the beginning of the story. The way things are before the action starts. It introduces the central character and provides a background on dramatic context. When we before we read a story or before we read a book, what happens to us? We normally look at the cover and check what the story is all about. And as you read the first page, it tells you 
Uh -uh. I must read further. This is the beginning of the story. Now we get introduced to the central character. And now we get background of this particular story. And it makes you want to learn more or to read more. You are now introduced to conflict, which leads to the complication or the rising action. This part of the story offers a series of events that complicates the central character's situation. Let's take an example of Cry the Beloved Country. We have Mr. Kumalo seated at home. He receives a letter. The letter invites him to come to Johannesburg. And we all open our eyes and ears. We want to know more. Why is this old man invited to come to Johannesburg? We have, we are now introduced to the conflict. He has a sister called Gertrude. We, he has a son called Absalom. He has a brother called John. And where are these three people? They all gone to Johannesburg. But the letter is not touching on the two, on John and Absalom. It's only focusing on Gertrude, that Gertrude is sick. Then we want to know more. So it's like it says here, it includes a series of conflicts. Another conflict that we mark here is there's also John. There's also Absalom. Where are they? In Johannesburg. And Kumalo must now go to Johannesburg to see his sick sister. So there's a crisis in the story. And the crisis will lead to a climax. What is a climax now? It's the turning point. Mr. Kumalu is now in Johannesburg. When he is in Johannesburg, what happens in Johannesburg? Things happen. There are intense moments. Mentally or in action. He realizes that the sister is a prostitute. He is not sick as in physical, but he is sick in moral. Also, what happened? The son, Absalom, is missing in action. He's able to find Absalom. And what is the state of Absalom? He has impregnated a girl. He is wanted for murder. So at some point, some force, something forces the character to make a decision or to take a course of action. In the case of Mr. Kumal, he makes a several decisions. Remember he left home. Now he is in Johannesburg. All these things come to him and he feels very sad about those. It is at this point where he, he must make or he must make decisions and uh, or the course of action reverse itself. He is in pain about his son. He's in pain about his sister. But now he makes a decision. I'm going to take my nephew from my sister, or I'm going to take my sister and my nephew back home to Ndochene. She has suffered a lot in Johannesburg, and she needs to change and come and relax at home. It is at that actual moment when the deciding factor 
takes place, what happens at this point determines the outcome of the event. So there are several conflicts or climaxes in this story, cry the beloved country. You will learn them as, as we read. The falling action now. All of that action that follows the climax. The conflict begins to resolve itself. Absalom is no longer a wanted man. He's now in prison. Gertrude has found place at Mrs. Ditere. His brother John decides he's not going back home. He's going to help his son to come out of the mess. So it is a falling action. So resolution. What is resolution? It is the conclusion. How all these threats come together. One story here, one story there, the other story here, and they all come to a conclusion. We see all these threats coming together and we find our conclusion. There is peace, just relative peace for the Kumalos. So it is at that point that we find ourselves at. On the first part, we have learned to read on a very basic level at level one. Now, we are going to read on a deeper level, that is analysis. We have learned about the characters on level one. We know the storyline, we know the conflict. Now, we have to be more academic. Figurative language. And we're going to learn about the tone. So things are becoming more interesting. Enter the figures of speech. What are those figures of speech? You're going to learn about your simile, your metaphor, personification, alliteration, onomatopoeia, hyperbole, and idioms. As you peruse your set work, please learn all these technical items called figurative language. What are figures of speech used for? We have those that compare. We're asking you to contrast. That is, we're looking for opposites. We have figures of speech that exaggerate or create understatements. And we have figures of speech that are used to recreate sounds. And what are those figures of speech? We have these three figures of speech that has to do with comparison. Remember the use of figures of speech? We compare. So we have what we call a simile, you are familiar with similes, metaphor, as well as personification. We're using a method called ID to explain in context what the extract is all about. This is a simple way to grasp the figures of speech. The I stands for identify the figures of speech. The D stands for describe the two things compared. And learners, when we compare, we need to be specific. 
the E in the ID is when you are required to explain why the poet or author has made that particular comparison. This is what you need to practice for the whole year. In an ideal exam scenario, when we ask you to identify a figure of speech, it's for one mark. And when you, we ask you to describe or to explain in context, what happens now? You are going to show us that you understand what a simile is by comparing the two things and that you get a mark for that. You will conclude for the next mark by doing what? By explaining why the author or the poet has made that particular comparison. You must know each time you see a figure of speech, it is followed by explanation. Let's look at an example of a figure of speech. Poverty has a home in Africa like a quiet second skin. This you find in the story Village People. Those of us that are studying short stories, identify the figure of speech. Correctly so, it is a simile. How do we know that it is a simile? The use of like. We can also have S A to make sure that we are using a simile. Then the description there. Poverty is compared to a person's second skin. So the description of the comparison is specific. What is being compared to what? Poverty is compared to a person's second skin. Poverty has a home in Africa like a quiet second skin. So if you say that, can you see that this is very specific? Poverty is compared to what? To a person's second skin. The explanation for the second, for the third mark. Poverty is part of Africa. How? It is like a second skin is part of a person. So you have your ID there, the I and the D and the E. Identification, description that is being very specific, and the explanation. We have a second example. I have got in my children, my Africa, I have got a zoo in here. A mad zoo of hungry animals and the keeper is frightened. Who said these words? That's Mr. M. Identify the figure of speech. It's a metaphor for one mark. Mr. M compares his heart to a mad zoo of hungry animals. We don't say Mr. M compares his heart. We don't say Mr. M compares to a hungry animal. No, we must be very specific. Compares what? His heart. To what? To a mad zoo of hungry animals. So the description must be very specific. The explanation, it shows how he feels in his heart about losing grip on his learner's who want to join the boycotts. So that's 
for the third mark. We have a second mark for the specific comparison and then the explanation why the playwright here has made this particular comparison. We also have a third example found in the short story, The New Tribe. The room was frozen into silence. So we have an implied comparison there, which is a metaphor, it's a, which is a personification. I'm sorry about that. It's a personification. The room was frozen into silence. Who gets silent? A human being, isn't it? So this room is compared to what? To a person that has fallen silent. The room now has human qualities. That's the reason why this figure of speech is personification. Explanation. Why has the author used this particular figure of speech? The people in the room are silent. Why are they silent? To emphasize the shock that the Alintons feel. So that's how we explain our figures of speech. The first part of the figures of speech, comparison. The second part is opposites. Two of them that describes opposites, we have an irony and we have sarcasm. What is irony? When you say something, but you mean something else. An example of irony. This castle has a pleasant seat. The air nibbly and sweetly recommends itself unto gentle senses. Who's speaking here? It's king. Is the king in Macbeth. He has gone to Macbeth's place and when he gets there, he looks at the castle and says, this castle has a pleasant seat. The air nibbly and sweetly recommends itself unto gentleness. But that is ironic. Why is that ironic? The king comments on the beautiful place. Little does he know that he is about to be murdered there. So that is an irony. We see something, he says something, the beauty of the palace. But underneath that beauty, danger is lacking. He is about to be murdered there. So that's how we explain an irony. Let's look at exaggeration and understatement as part of figures creative language. We have an, a hyperbole or exaggeration. What is it used for? It is used for emphasis. We also have euphemism, which is an understatement. You refer to something unpleasant in a deliberate, pleasant way. Because you don't want to hurt people's feelings, isn't it? You don't want to be that blunt. If you don't want to be blunt, what do you do? You use euphemism. Let's look at, it, at an example here. I was coming home from some place at the end of the world. That's an exaggeration, isn't it? Some place at the end of the world. It's a hyperbole. He is exaggerating to emphasize that he came from 
a place very far away. So that explains a hyperbole. At the end of the world. Have you been to the end of the world? No. It is just an exaggeration. And we call that a hyperbole. A figurative language that has to do with sounds. Let's look at them. We have onomatopoeia, alliteration, and assonance. Alliteration or assonance indicate which sounds are repeated for emphasis. Onomatopoeia, it indicates the words to recreate the sounds they describe. So we look at the examples. The examples of alliteration. Let's look at this. A four-foot box, a foot for every year. Where do you find this? In the short story, in the poem, sorry, mid term break. A four-foot box, a foot for every year. You remember the poem? The poem about the little boy who died. Let's look at assonance. When winds in wheels. So can you see the repetition there of we, 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 wheels? Okay. With alliteration, the... F okay. Let's look at onomat onomatopoeia. While I listen to the buzzing of flies in captive. The poem, captive, buzzing of flies. What happens when the bees or the flies buzz? You, you find that sound and that gives you the idea of onomatopoeia. The sound it makes also have that weight. Right. We, let's look at the tone. Tone of voice is not about what you say, but how you say it. It is the attitude or emotion that someone has in their voice. Tone of voice shows how the speaker feels about something. When you get home, you want something from your mother. You want to ask them for five rents. You're not going to say, I want five rents. That will be very disrespectful. Your mother will not give it to you, isn't it? You're going to start by saying, Mom, are you tired this afternoon? Would you love a cup of tea? And uh -uh, mothers will always know that you're up to something. But you shall have touched their heart, isn't it? That is the feeling. And by the time you say, you know, I need five friends to do the following. And they will easily oblige. But you don't just come in and say, I want. You first offer a cup of tea or a massage on the Feet of your tired mommy. So the tone of voice shows how the speaker feels about something. And it also has what? It touches on the attitude or emotion that someone has in their voice. When you say, I want five rents, that's disrespectful, isn't it? Then when you say, I would, would you please? And then it shows your tone is full of uh, 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 pleading. You want to urge someone to do a favor for you. There are tone words that we use. Tone simply refers to how the author feels towards the subject 
or something you will know what the author's tone is by implying the words he uses and then we also have what we call mood it refers to the feeling of the atmosphere the author is describing it is what the author makes you feel when you read his writing you can read a sentence and feel sad or happy or angry when you read cry the beloved country you will have a box of kleenex next to you as you read the words will draw you to cry and feel sad isn't it when you read sonnet a uh, shakespeare sonnet what do you do you feel very excited and jubilant that's how the words make you feel how do we recognize tone in a text a writer will use a subtle ways to express his or her thoughts and the feelings of a speaker or, na or, or a narrator or the character. The words used, diction, the choice of words the writer uses in his or her writing. The point of view, the writer's view and how it affects his or her writing. Syntax, the arrangement of words to create sentences. Remember the story that you read in grade 11? I'm not talking about that now. When the boy came home in the middle of the night, demanding food from the parents. And when the mother said, remember what you did during the day? And he kept on saying, I don't want to talk about that now. I don't want to talk about that now. So the words transport you to have certain feelings and attitude. And by the time he says, I don't want to talk about that now, you also being very cross with the young man because it's in the middle of the night and the parents are sleeping and he disrespectfully comes in their room and demands food. So the choice of words the writer uses, the writer's view and how it affects his or her writing, the arrangement of words to create sentence. That's how we recognize tone. The formality or the informality of the text. Tone changes. We recognize the differences we note how the attitude of a speaker changes. We also recognize where the shift is. We see the change. Would you see the change? Yes. As you read, your literature ear should be attuned to different sounds and the words and the impact of words when the tone changes. Let's look at the usual tone words that we use. We are happy, that's what we are all the time. Oh, we are sad. Oh, we are mad about something. In the process of your study in 2022, can you start now learning new words, enriching yourself, having strong vocabulary instead of, way of happy? You can be merry, ecstatic, cheerful, optimistic, or pleased. When you are sad, you are depressed, disappointed lonely, miserable, or pessimistic. When you are charging like a bull now in a China shop, what happens to you? You are angry. If you made you angry or you bitter or 
frustrated or you very furious or you are outraged so learn the tone waves as you proceed with your study in 2022 further words that one can use surprised or you are curious or you are accelerated shocked you are astonished or you are inquisitive if there's something that's making you scared you can use afraid you horrified nervous when the boy comes in the room speaks to the parents disrespectfully then you say you are horrified and then you can also be fearful what can happen to him and it makes you feel uncomfortable disgust you are embarrassed about something or you feel inferior or shame or insignificant or inadequate about a particular issue i'm looking forward to your writing at school your teachers will give us a report that you are using new relevant ways for tone now we are going to read for the deepest level that is level as well as level four and five things are becoming more critical now what do we learn here level three and level four and five themes and then also own opinion what's a theme it is the message it is made up of the words the and me sage to make what theme can you see that the theme of a work of literature it is its underlying message or a big idea which is timeless and also universal it is not only timeless but it is universal it is the big idea and when we say it is timeless it means it is not only relevant in 2022 or relevant in 1965 when the book was written it is also very universal it is applicable in the u.s it is applicable in Africa. It is applicable in Europe. So it has a universal idea. And we call that a big idea of the story. So that's what books are. They give us big ideas, underlying messages that are timeless, as well as universal. What critical belief about life does the author convey? Why does it matter? The theme is best described as a statement rather than one word. It is not just a statement, it can be expressed as a statement rather than one word. How do we figure out the theme we look at the conflict what causes the struggle we look at words said the dialogue how the people talk we study the characters how do they change and what is often mentioned and what is described in detail and that is what is our theme you look at all these questions here 
and the bottom line is that it's how you figure out the theme as we read do not just read the words we literature appeals to your critical thinking and how do we answer the theme questions we make a point we give an example we explain and then we link back to the point and we call this idea appeal method the discussion of the theme should include the following points among others when we ask you about the theme we are actually asking you to look at the if the theme was asked about an extract or the whole book you should have various responses you are not limited and if you give a well substantiated response you get your full marks but if you cannot substantiate we can still give you a one or a two but our aim in 2022 we would like you to respond to themes very well using the peer method and scoring full marks for your well substantiated responses your interpretation of the theme should not be general but must be grounded in the set work the theme will be given as a statement you can be tempted to write a general idea of what you understand by the word but we caution you beware we need you to be grounded in the text of the short story or the novel or the drama or the poem we have two ways of asking theme themes in an exam or in your classwork at school in an activity you could be given a theme and you need to discuss it or you could be asked to identify the theme in the extract or in the book and discuss either way be prepared remember we have given you ideas on how you should recognize the theme we have the last set of questions those are open-ended questions also this open-ended questions must be grounded in the text a general statement is made and you have to give your opinion firstly what do you need to do you give a statement and you support it with evidence from the text again learners you use the peel method you point you provide evidence you explain and you link back to the question what you are going to find in an exam they will ask you to discuss your view and as you discuss your view your response should either be yes i agree with the following oh no i don't agree remember again you use what your peer method if you substantiate well you get your full marks if you do not give a proper substantiation you can earn yourself one or two marks but remember 2022 what do we do we give 
full substantiation and we earn ourselves three marks. This peel method is like an orange. When you peel an orange, you have layers and layers. Let's look at Isabel in my children, my Africa. They say Isabel is the symbol of hope in the drama. That's a statement. Is it true that she, uh, she is a symbol of hope? If you agree, we are going to say yes. She is exposed to difficulties other races face through her interaction with Tammy and Mr. M. Okay. This, how are you going to explain that? This makes her aware of the plight of the greater South Africa. Remember, she was only confined to her home in Kamdebo, but by meeting Tammy and Mr. M, what happens? Her worldview is extended. She now becomes the hope in the drama through her interaction with the two gentlemen. How do we link it back? Tammy and Isabel prove that different races can work together despite their differences. If your response is no, in this instance, Tammy's decision to quit school proves that there is no hope. Tami decides to join the movement and agrees with other students. That's evident. Because he feels staying in his home, staying in his community of Brackwater doesn't give him hope. There's no hope in this drama. So what does he do? He decides to join the movement. Explanation, the students displays, display violence and loneliness, lawlessness during the boycott. Their behavior does not evoke any hope. So that's how we deal with open-ended questions. We have the following set works in 2022 that you have to study. We have Cry the Beloved Country that tells us the story of a father from rural South Africa to and through the city of Johannesburg in search of his son. We also have a strange case of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. Those are our two novels. It has the complexities of science and the duplicity of human nature. My children, my Africa, a black teacher who invested all his dreams for a better society in one of his pupils. We have our short stories, isn't it? Changes. We have amusing stories there, and sometimes we have triumphant stories and sad stories as well. And we have our poetry, the voice of the land. It's rich in poetry that is established from various points throughout the years. Not forgetting part of our drama, Macbeth who kills the king, becomes the new king, and kills more people out of paronia. So we have killing and blood all the way through. I know this year you only studying two genres. In our next lesson, prepare my children, my Africa, 
Act 1, Scene 1. We are going to spend time together dealing with Act 1, Scene 1 in its totality. In its, in its totality. Let's see this quote, very profound quote. Every African soul is, is either carrying a bundle or in it what is wrong with this world that it wants to waste you like that. My children, my Africa. This is the words by Mr. M and the book written by Athol Fugard. Every African swan is either carrying a bundle or is in it. What is wrong with this world that it wants to waste you like that? My children, my Africa. We all know this is a very strong story that we're going to spend time together and uh, explaining it and uh, preparing ourselves for the 2022 exams. I would like you when you come to class next week, please bring along your Act 1, Scene 1 because I will be referring to the extract or to the book as we proceed. Remember, literature is the art of discovering something extraordinary about ordinary people and saying with ordinary words something extraordinary. It is a way of discovering yourselves and other people. And as we learn and go through the study of literature, this is what we're going to achieve in 2022. Thank you for watching this lesson.